One of the moments I look forward to most at the beginning of every new summer season is my first sighting of a hummingbird. Ever since I was a child, I have been fascinated with these incredibly beautiful and ancient birds. The way they will hover at a flower collecting nectar has always been an image I have cherished. This winter, I learned of a new book about hummingbirds. John Shuey's The Hummingbird Handbook, which inspired me to want to learn more about these mysterious creatures. After reading The Hummingbird Handbook, I contacted John to see if he would join me on Nature Revisited to share the lives and the habits of these mysterious creatures. Here then is my conversation with John Shuey. I thank you for joining us. My name is Stefan Van Norden, and this is Nature Revisited. How did you first get interested in hummingbirds? Well, that's, that's my mother's fault. When I was just a kid, when we were growing up over in eastern Idaho, she put bird feeders up, and that included, during the summer, hummingbird feeders. So I kind of developed a fascination with birds early on. And that sort of dovetailed into a, a fascination with, you know, nature in general. In those days, I could fly fish three different creeks in the mountains. Fly fishing and uh, uh, interest in nature sort of go hand in hand. Uh, because the one hobby puts you in a position to be immersed in nature all the time. And so that's where the fascination with birds began. But my real intrigue with hummingbirds started many years later when on June 1st, 2012, Tim Blunt and I were on a five-day bird photography mission in some of the remote parts of southeastern Oregon. So we were on top of a place called Heart Mountain, in the middle of nowhere. And when we got out of the trucks, we noticed there were hummingbirds buzzing around. And so I started photographing because we realized what we found were broad-tailed hummingbirds, which are exceedingly rare in Oregon. They're more a bird of the Rocky Mountains. So we were thrilled with our good luck. I photographed these birds for probably 30 minutes. And I came around a, a hedgerow and found a different species of hummingbird. And I photographed him. It turned out to be a ruby-throated hummingbird. And it turned out to be the only the third recorded ruby-throating hummingbird ever confirmed for the state of Oregon. So I couldn't believe serendipity of finding a very rare hummingbird for the state of Oregon and a species that's almost never found in Oregon. That's because the ruby-throated hummingbird is the species found throughout the eastern United States. I got to thinking, you know, I, I was kind of fascinated by the convergence of these two rare species in one place where they shouldn't be. More importantly, I really pondered the journey that that ruby-throated hummingbird had taken. I mean, he's way outside of his normal range. And I was really wondering, you know, where did he come from? How did he get so far off course? And where would he end up? And when I started contemplating those mysteries, I I really started developing a, a, a deep interest in hummingbirds and learning more about them. So give our listeners an idea of just how many different types of species there are and where do most of those different species, where do they spend their time? Hummingbirds are New World birds. They're only found in the Americas. The vast majority live in South America and Central America. And that's to the tune of something like 330 different species. There are eight widespread species of hummingbirds in the United States. One of those is the ruby throat that's found in the eastern half of the, of the continent. The other seven are found in different ranges throughout the West. And then there are seven additional species that are limited to the deep Southwest. One of those species is found on the Gulf Coast, and it's rare there. And the other species, the other six of those, are found primarily in southern Arizona. So they're very limited ranges. But having said that, those eight species that have widespread ranges in the United States actually spend most of their time in Mexico because they're migratory. They show up in their nesting ranges in the United States beginning in mid-spring 
and then they tend to depart and leave the United States for their winter grounds in Mexico by early fall. Why do you think, or what do you think makes most of us react the way we do when we see a hummingbird? We tend to have this a visceral response to these birds because they're they're so enigmatic and so fascinating. I think a lot of that has to do with the not only the fact that they the males particularly are so colorful and so so bedazzling that they're you know it's just striking when you see a, a male hummingbird in all its colorful glory. But even the duller colored females and juveniles, you know, they all have one thing in common: they live life at this this minuscule hyper speed. It's so fascinating to us because I think it's a speed that we don't really comprehend. So we find it so interesting. They live at this frenetic pace that we don't we, we find so fascinating because we don't really understand it. Uh, you know, most of us we we look at that frenetic pace that they live life at, and, and we're just sort of amazed by it. And then on top of that, you know, the, it's easy to anthropomorphize a hummingbird because people describe them as curious and friendly. And because of their interactions with humans, you know, it's every person who, who puts up hummingbird feeders has these close-up encounters with hummingbirds that fly up close to your face or buzz by your face at warp speed to the point you're afraid you're going to have a collision with them. But what they're really doing is just being hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are sort of uh, naturally inquisitive because they need to be to, to uh, continue to seek food sources. But because of that behavior, they, they sort of endear themselves to us. So you mentioned in your book that hummingbirds have reached kind of a, a celebrity status. What is it that has brought them such attention? You know, certainly it's their bedazzling colors and their unique lifestyle, uh, you know, and it, it helps that they're packaged in teeny tiny little bodies. So, uh, you know, all of that uh, has led to sort of a, a hummingbird tourism industry even where people will uh, travel long distances for the sole purpose of seeing hummingbirds, particularly species they haven't seen before. And I especially enjoy the, the fact that hummingbirds serve as what I call portals to the natural world for people that may not otherwise be all that interested in, in the natural world. And I think they're important that way. In that sense, these guys are, you know, they're little ambassadors that help usher people into maybe a deeper appreciation for the natural world. At least I, I hope that's, you know, how it, how it happens. What are some of the folklore that surrounds these beautiful birds? They have a very interesting history with humans. Yeah, they really do. I mean, the indigenous cultures, of course, have lived alongside hummingbirds for at least fourteen or 15,000 years. But when Europeans discovered them, they were mystified by them. They'd never seen anything quite like them. So naturally, some folklore has developed over time. And I think my, my very favorite is the old wife's tale about how hummingbirds migrate by snuggling up into the, the downy feathers of geese. Hummingbirds are very capable flyers, even though they're, they're tiny, they migrate long distances. Some years back, I was outside here in Salem at a, at walking across a community college campus, and out of the field across the road, a big flock of Canada geese got up out of the, out of the grass and, and flew overhead at low elevation. And I had to do a double take because there was a hummingbird up there darting amongst the geese, you know, kind of from one goose to the other, like he was sort of harassing them or something, which probably is what he was doing. But it certainly makes you, you see something like that and you think, you know, maybe there is something to that old wives' tale. But yeah, it's, it's, they've certainly, you know, created a, a certain amount of folklore about them. How did some of the native peoples, how did they use the hummingbird in their cultures? Yeah, so you have to keep in mind that throughout the Americas for at least 15,000 years, we really don't know how many different cultures that, that uh, comprised Native Americans because there were many different language groups and 15,000 years of uh, language evolution and cultural evolution. But certainly we have records, you know, of early explorers who interacted with indigenous peoples and learned a little bit about what they thought about hummingbirds. And, you know, if you go down to Central America, the Aztecs actually considered the hummingbird a representation of a, of a war god. It's, it's hard to pronounce, but it's Huichi la Puchili. So they, they, they sort of revered them. And from what we know from uh, records of the, the Spanish conquistadors and the missionaries, some of those Central American cultures, you know, sort of revered and, and uh, worshipped hummingbirds to some extent. Also in the record, if you go up to uh, British Columbia, there's record of Native peoples using hummingbird skins for children's clothing. 
capturing live hummingbirds to use as children's toys. While there may have been stigmas against killing or harming hummingbirds in some cultures, obviously those stigmas didn't exist in other cultures. A lot of mystery that we will probably never know how all the cultures reacted to hummingbirds, but it seems to have run the spectrum. Was there at some point a, a commercial value to these birds? Unfortunately, there was, and, and uh, that extends to many species of birds, especially bright-colored birds of the New World and of Asia and Africa. And that all had to do with women's hats. That was mostly a Victorian-era craze around the world in uh, Europe, in England, in the Americas, where women wore these fancy hats adorned with feathers and bird skins and even complete stuffed birds. And it was a huge industry. It's called the millinery industry, all fed by the, the worldwide trade networks of the European nations. I've actually looked up auction sale reports from the 1800s and the, the number of exotic birds, skins, and bird feathers that were sold at just one auction are just staggering, and that included hummingbirds. It's really difficult to gauge at this point whether significant damage was done to any hummingbird populations in the New World because of the millinery trade. The demise of, of some species in, in modern times is all about habitat loss, so it's hard to gauge you know, in, in the case of hummingbirds, if there was significant lasting damage done, we just don't really have a way of tracking that. But the collectors would, would pay indigenous peoples to go out and and uh, harvest as many of these birds as they could, uh, it, hummingbirds and other species. So it was really just wholesale worldwide slaughter for decades. The scientists of the day, as well as private collectors, um, collected huge quantities of hummingbirds uh, just for scientific study and for private collections. I remember seeing a auction listing for a Victorian era, I guess it was a diorama that would go around or in front of a fireplace, and it was gilded and encased in glass and had like, it must have been, I don't know, I think it was a hundred or so hummingbirds mounted inside of it. And then there were, I've seen reports of uh, hummingbird cloaks and hummingbird coats from the Victorian era that, you know, if, if you could find one today on the market and, and actually buy it, it would cost you a fortune. And it's going to cost a fortune in those days, too. So they certainly were quick to make commercial work of them. And I assume, that, of course, that most of that has stopped? They're fully protected in the United States, of course, but also by international trade agreements, such as the, the CITES, which is the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species, and uh, various uh, country-to-country -country, uh, agreements. So luckily, hummingbirds are legally fully protected. What are some of the migratory habits of the hummingbird? In you know our North American species, especially those in the in the United States north of Mexico, are strongly migratory because they essentially have to be to escape the northern winters. But what's amazing is how far they can actually migrate. You take, for example, uh, a black chin hummingbird that's nesting in, say, northern Montana or southern Alberta. You know that bird is migrating all the way to central Mexico to spend the winter, and making that journey twice a year: one southward journey, one northward journey. And uh, there's, there's even bigger feats than that. The rufous hummingbird is the long-distance champion. The rufous hummingbird is, is a common hummingbird of the, of the uh, northwest and, and uh, western Canada. I have them in my yard. They, they nest in, in Oregon. They migrate down to central Mexico for the winter. And some years ago, a, a bird bander captured one down in Florida in uh, late winter and banded that bird. And then a few months later, a bird bander in Alaska recaptured that bird. By that recapture and, and identifying the band, they were able, able to determine that that bird had flown about 4,000 miles just between Florida and, and Alaska. And had it spent the winter in, in that, on the Gulf Coast or had it from Mexico to there earlier in the winter? But that's a long, long ways for a, a bird that weighs about a penny and a half <laughs> to, to fly. <laughs> Uh, you know, there's so much that's not known about them that we really don't know a lot about that. They they don't form flocks like geese or ducks do. They may migrate in, in loose associations. And, uh, you know, once one interesting ongoing study is how ruby-throated hummingbirds cross the Gulf of Mexico because a significant portion of, of the ruby-throated hummingbirds, which nest in eastern North America, fly down to the Gulf Coast during the late summer and then feed heavily to put on body weight for a crossing over the Gulf of Mexico. 
for a bird that generally during its frenetic activity during the nesting season and the, and the territorial defense season in the spring and summer, these birds will they'll feed every eight or ten minutes at times to keep their fuel levels up. And so for these birds to undertake that journey across the Gulf of Mexico with, with no food sources is amazing and still under study. So how difficult is it to identify the different types of hummingbirds? Well, it can be a real challenge, Stefan. You know, the, the males are easiest, the adult males, because they have all these colorful characteristics that identify them. There are exceptions to that. You know, right here in, in the West, especially in California, we have both the uh, Rufus hummingbird and the Allen's hummingbird. The only, it's very difficult even to tell the males apart. And the females of the Allen's and Rufus, you cannot differentiate between them unless you have them in hand and you're studying, you know, very specific feather characteristics, you know, so most of them aren't going to you know, be, be given that opportunity. But for the most part, the males of the birds here, of the species here in North America are easily identified when they're in adult plumage. But the challenge comes with the juveniles and the females. And that's, you know, that can be troublesome uh, frequently, even for experts, you know, even for bird banders who are capturing them to put little tiny bands on their legs. They catch a lot of juveniles during the, the fall migration they have to study them very, very closely in hand sometimes to determine which species they're looking at. But I always tell people that you don't have to be able to identify every hummingbird you see to enjoy these birds. I mean, certainly that's not a requirement. Uh, you know, if you enjoy being able to identify the different species, that's part of the fun. But it's certainly not a, a necessary part of enjoying hummingbirds. And one of the easiest ways to identify hummingbirds in, in the United States is to understand where they're supposed to be and when. So if I see a hummingbird here in Oregon in February or in January, I'm about 100% certain it's going to be an Anna's hummingbird because that's the only species that spends the winter this far north. And if you see a hummingbird where you live, Stefan, it's about a 99.99% .99 certainty that you've got a ruby-throated hummingbird. How difficult is it to photograph these birds? Well, that is a challenge. They are um, mighty quick, and they're tiny, so... If you want to get really crisp, clean, professional-level photography, you have to get close. You have to shoot at high, high shutter speeds, and you have to be very patient. So they are, they are challenging, but they're also a lot of fun because they're so colorful. And one of the things I've noticed over the years of photographing hummingbirds is sometimes you can do everything just right, and a male hummingbird will turn its head just a little bit, and it's like a flash bulb going off with that glittery color on, under their throat. And it can really wreak havoc with a, a camera's sensors and do some funny things to do photography. But, uh, they, you know, in that respect, uh, you know, they are, uh, they are difficult but they are to photograph, but they are a lot of fun to photograph also. Do hummingbirds really see red? They do. The, they, they have enhanced photoreceptors in their eyes to, to pick out red shades, yeah. They do. They, they pick out red very well. And because of the way their photoreceptors are arranged to, to pick out those colors, they actually have this enhanced vision for the red tones, and that helps them pick out those tones against a sea of green background, you know, when they're, when they're in flight. And so that's why they, they tend to be, you know, pretty readily attracted to reds and oranges and pinks and purples. So when people want to attract them to their homes, uh, red is, is, is the color of choice. It's a great way to go, you know, and if you haven't had hummingbirds at your home before, then, you know, using red feeders, even red ribbons on your feeders, red flowers, great way to go. As a follow-up, is it a good idea to attract these birds? Are we not making them more dependent on us? I mean, I know for some birds, it's not a, necessarily a good idea to take the bird out of its natural environment. Yeah, so Stefan, I think that is just a great question, and it's an important question. So for starters, we've already altered their habitat dramatically. You know, we have created, inadvertently created, excellent hummingbird habitat just by being people, just by creating towns and gardens and orchards and open spaces with lots of flowers. We, we've done that without even thinking about hummingbirds. So we've done that on a massive scale in the United States, as you know. That part's sort of a done deal. We can't really undo that. Um, but should we be catering to them? Should we be putting out feeders full of sugar water? To me, the answer is yes, under certain circumstances. And those circumstances are as long as you adhere to critical protocol of feeding only a mixture of four parts water to one part plain white sugar, and always 
keeping that sugar water immaculately fresh and keeping your feeders immaculately clean. Because it's really important not to do more harm than good. And when I was working on the book and talked to a couple of bird rehabilitators, they said that a, a fair number of the hummingbirds that they get into rehabil- rehabilitation centers are suffering from poisoning from black mold that grows if you leave your hummingbird food out for a couple of days too long. So it's really important to be a really good hummingbird host. Now, the reason I say that I support feeding hummingbirds artificial nectar is because of what I mentioned before. I think hummingbirds play a valuable role as being ambassadors for the natural world. They have this power to draw us in and interest us, even if we're people that don't really have much background in in interacting or being interested in nature. To me, it gets back to the simple question of, in our current society, at the pace we operate, with children being immersed in tablets and iPhones, who will be our future conservationists? Who will be the people that are going to re- replace people like you, Stefan? You know, who's going, to, who's going to take your role? If we don't create some urgency and some and, – and the only way you create urgency is you create interest. You find a way to make a kid say, that's pretty dang cool, and I want to look into that more. I want to be curious. And hummingbirds have the power to make people curious. And that's why, to me – even though a lot of people in, in, in scientific fields might disagree. I just think it's okay to cater to hummingbirds for that reason, as long as we do it in a way that doesn't do any harm. So in your book, you list the growing number of events, festivals, et cetera, that, that are going on, that, that people are becoming fascinated with these birds. What happens at a hummingbird festival, and do you recommend visiting them? It's funny because when I was doing the work on this book, I didn't realize how many hummingbird festivals are are operating. Now, I I hope that post-pandemic, they all get right back to doing their thing and and holding these festivals again because they are important. You know, one of the aspects that that is coming to many of these festivals is that they will have hummingbird banders on site, frequently actually capturing and banding hummingbirds. So it gives people of all ages a chance to get up close and personal and, and really get a close view of these birds that they wouldn't otherwise get. A lot of these hummingbird festivals are held during the migration season so that they'll have feeders out and flowers out, so you sort of get maximum density of hummingbirds. One of the great sights in nature, one of the the great phenomena, is the opportunity to see dozens and dozens of hummingbirds in their little hyperactive states in one place at one time. It's really just a, a fun thing to see. I've encountered people who are from, you know, nine years old to 90 years old who are just all smiles when the subject of hummingbirds comes up or when they get to see one up close. They also tend to to bring in expert lectures to do a variety of different uh, programs. You know, you're at hummingbird events, you'll have lectures doing programs not just about birds, but about uh, how to create pollinator gardens and the importance of those kind of, of uh, habitats. Yeah, there's a lot to be recommended about these types of festivals. How do and what can hummingbirds teach us not only just about our about nature but our relationship to our environment yeah that's a good question you know the the thing that i think we can learn most from hummingbirds and the valuable lesson is how interconnected we are with our environment and that's something that as as the pace of civilization human civilization has increased so dramatically we tend to lose sight of that of how connected we are and and how critical our connection with the natural world is because you learn things when you when you look at hummingbirds you learn about these interrelationships just the other day i read a study about flowers called a columbine now we're all probably familiar with the beautiful blue colorado columbine the state flower but there's many different species of columbine and it's, as it turns out columbines have these long spurs that make them this a really uh, flamboyant flower But at the end of those spurs is where they keep their little dose of nectar. And nectar is a substance, a sugary substance, that draws in pollinators like bees and hummingbirds and moths and butterflies so that they can cross-pollinate flowers of the same species. And hummingbirds do this by getting to that nectar, but in the process, the flowers arrange so that pollen gets on their face, on their bill, and then they fly to the next bloom and the next flower, and they cross-pollinate that way. But what's interesting about this study I read is that columbines have the ability to adapt fairly quickly in evolutionary terms 
in uh, respect to the length of those spurs. So if speciation is occurring and their primary pollinator becomes a hummingbird with a long bill and a long tongue, those spurs tend to evolve to be a little bit longer. If speciation occurs so that a nectar-feeding moth that has a very short tongue can't reach the nectar, the columbines react on an evolutionary scale fairly quickly to shorten those spurs. So that kind of interconnectedness is something that we tend to lose sight of, and we're part of that natural cycle. I mean, we're all connected in ways that we probably don't understand. And, uh, you know, so I think hummingbirds are, are a great lesson about the interconnectedness of everything in nature, including human beings. So they're imbued with that power to really engage people to learn more about the natural world. So how do you see the future of these incredible birds? Well, you know, there's, so there's about 340 species of hummingbirds. There's uh, oh, a dozen or so that are critically endangered. They all live in, uh, in Central and South America, especially South America. And the reasons for being critically endangered are almost always loss of habitat or change, you know, changes in habitat wrought by invasive species. Suffering in, in many places, the species, some of these species are probably not going to be around in the next, uh, within a decade or two decades. It's a, it's a challenge because like all habitat loss, what we're dealing with are the right of humans to, to make a living and, and lead a life. But I always figure, you know, there's, there's ways to do it better. You know, there, there's the Hummingbird Society and other bird organizations that are really dedicated to, uh, to helping with issues like habitat loss. On the, on the positive side, the North American species of hummingbirds, by and large, are doing well. And in some cases, they seem to be increasing their numbers. That's certainly the case for our local year-round resident out here on the West Coast, which is the Anna's hummingbird. The Anna's hummingbird was historically confined essentially to the Santa Ana Mountains of Southern California. And in the last century, uh, starting in the middle of the last century, they started expanding their range northward. In fact, they're expanding their range so quickly as of the last two winters, Anna's hummingbirds are now showing up routinely in western Idaho. So they're expanding eastward, they're expanding northward. We've created habitat for them inadvertently, and they've followed along. And they've done so uh, in a way and, and so rapidly that they haven't had time to evolve a seasonal migration pattern. So they stay put all winter and and everybody in the Pacific Northwest who's interested in hummingbirds gets an abject lesson every winter in just how tough these birds are, even though they're tiny little things. It's am amazing they can survive these winters, but they do. So finally for me, when I see a hummingbird, I get a real sense of the sacred. Do you feel that same way, and why do you think that is? Well, I do, and... Part of it, I think, for me personally, is just I'm so routinely fascinated by their behavior. And I don't know if that applies to everybody who, who watches hummingbirds, but I, I never get tired of, of seeing their interactions with one another and their environment. And in that sense, you know, I'm just continually amazed by them. Um, but I'm also always keenly aware that these hummingbirds really are ambassadors. And, and I just I'm so intrigued by their power to draw people in who might otherwise never care about birds or never care about the natural environment, but they, they just have this, this aura about them. And it, so it's, I think it's a combination of their, their appearance and habits that makes them so fascinating to us. And, you know, there's, there's, it's so iconic, you know, the image in, in our minds of a hummingbird hovering at a beautiful red flower in your garden. If you would like to learn more about these incredible birds, please check out The Hummingbird Handbook by John Shuey and published by Timber Press. If you enjoyed this episode, please share with family, friends, and colleagues. You can always subscribe to Nature Revisited on your favorite podcast server. You can also follow us on Instagram, YouTube, or on our website, NordenProductions.com. That's Norden, N-O-O-R-D-E-N, Productions.com. If you would like to share your thoughts or comments, please send them to us on our website, and we will share them on our Instagram page. 
Nature Revisited is produced by Stefan Van Orden and Charles Kagan. I hope you will join us for the next edition of Nature Revisited. And in the meantime, remember, we are nature. <laughs>